Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the vestibular system. Okay, so before we go further on and talk about the vestibular ocular reflex, I want to put out there a correction to something that I said in the previous video. So in the previous video, I told you, in fact I assured you, that the second order neurons within the vestibular nuclear complexes that are going to take the signal up to the cerebral cortex, I told you that those do not cross over. I said, uh, to take an example, that a, a second order neuron in the right uh, vestibular nuclear complex here, it would send its axon into the right medial lemniscus, it would ascend up into the right ventral lateral and ventral posterior thalamic nuclei, it would synapse on a third order neuron there, and that neuron would send its axon over to the right vestibular cortex. And the same on the left hand side. That was a lie, and I had doubts about this when I was actually telling you um, this, because everything else crosses, all the other sensory information crosses, so why would this vestibular information not cross? And I've gone and looked it up now, and it does cross. So, to clarify then, the second order neurons in the right vestibular nuclear complex, they will send their axons into the left medial lemniscus, so there will be a crossover, which I will add on here, and I'll do it in pink, I think, so there's a crossover. The fibres will go into the left medial lemniscus uh, and will ascend up to the left ventral lateral and ventral posterior thalamic nuclei, and the third order neurons will go to the left vestibular cortex. For the left hand side, the bipolar neurons will come in from the left vestibular system, they'll sign up some second order neurons that are going to deliver the message up to the cerebral cortex. Those will send their axons into the right medial lemniscus, they'll go up to the right ventral lateral and ventral posterior thalamic nuclei, and then the third order neurons will go up to the right vestibular cortex. So it does cross, it does not remain ipsilateral, so it does go to the contralateral uh, vestibular cortex. So, sorry about that, I hope that is now clear. So that is the um, vestibulothalamo cortical pathway now finished. So let's now go on to the vestibulo-ocular reflex. Now, the first thing that I want to do with the vestibulo-ocular reflex is just tell you a little bit more about it. So I'm not going to write out its full name because I introduced this right at the start, so hopefully we're all prepared to call this the VOR from now on. Okay, so I want to tell you a little bit more about the vestibulo-ocular reflex, and then I want to talk about how this is actually going to operate. We need to talk a lot about the extraocular muscles, and this is really kind of beautiful, because we will see that the extraocular muscles all lie in one of the planes that the semicircular canals are in. And by the way, it's going to be the semicircular ducts that are really important in the vestibular ocular reflex that we're going to look at, which is the rotational vestibular ocular reflex. But for now, that's the only vestibular ocular reflex that we're going to talk about. It's the major one that people study, so we'll just refer to it as the vestibular ocular reflex. I'll come back to that comment right at the end. Um, okay, so, let me tell you more about what the vestibular ocular reflex is. So let me draw a picture of someone's head viewed from above then. Okay, so here is someone's head, here is their nose, here are their eyes, like so. So we're looking from above, okay, and we're imagining that we can see their eyes, of course, if we're looking from above we wouldn't be able to see these, but um, for the basis of the picture it's helpful to have them there. Okay, so here is someone's head from above. Uh, this is clearly anterior, this is posterior, this is right, and this is left. So, the vestibular ocular reflex, to give you an example of what this is all about, let's imagine that this man's head is going to be turned to the right in this way. And again, you can think of this as voluntary, or you can think of this as something has driven it to happen, maybe the wind, or maybe someone's come up behind him and forcibly moved his head like this, okay? Um, so, something has caused his head to rotate to the right here. The vestibulo-ocular reflex is all about trying to maintain the retinal image, despite the fact that the head is moving, and in order to maintain the same retinal image, you're going to have to have the eyes moving leftward relative to the head. You see, if the eyes just remain stationary relative to the head, then they would rotate round to the right with the head, and then the retinal image would not be maintained. It would go into complete flux. 
and the visual system is not very good at gaining useful information from a retinal image that is in flux in that way, so we want to try and prevent that from happening. So in order to prevent that from happening, when the head moves this way, we need the eyes to move leftward within the head, so we need them to turn like this relative to the head, so that actually they're going to remain at the same looking in the same direction despite the fact that the head has moved and this is what the vestibular ocular reflex is all about. Now, in reality this portion that is under the control of the vestibular system is actually just part of the vestibular ocular reflex. So the vestibular ocular reflex can be divided up into two portions. What is known as the slow phase and what is known as the fast phase. And provided that your head movement is only of a small head movement, you will only see the slow phase. Whereas if it's big head movement, you will see the fast phase as well. So let me explain what I mean by this. If we make a big head movement to the right, are you actually going to be able to maintain the retinal image constant? The answer is no, because if the head movement is too large, there's only a certain amount that the eyes can look to the left within the head. There is an end to how much the eyes can deviate to the left, and they will hit that limit, okay? And they won't be able to move any more to the left, otherwise they have to look into the back of your head. Okay, so they will reach their limit. So if you're making a big head movement to the right, then your eyes will initially go into this slow phase. So as you're doing the movement, when you initially just are doing it, when you're just starting it, the eyes will be moving in the slow phase and they'll be going to the left relative to the head in order to fix the retinal image. However, they will get to the point where they can't go any more to the left. Uh, at, at, and yet the head is still rotating to the right. So we can't do it anymore. So then what happens is a fast phase where the eyes move to looking straight ahead again. Okay, so let's say, let me just actually draw a little bit of this out. So let's say that the head has rotated to this sort of angle here. Here's the nose. And let's say that the eyes have now rotated as much as they can in their sockets. They are still looking in this direction here. Okay, so this is the these arrows are meant to show the orientation of the eyes. And let's say this is as much as they can rotate to the left relative to the head. So if the head continues to move to the right, these can't move to the left anymore. So what actually happens now is a fast phase where the eyes will suddenly move rightward again so that they're focused straight ahead again. And then as the head continues to move right, they can then do the slow phase all over again. They'll refocus on something over here now, and then they'll try to fix the retinal image again over there. Okay, so it's effectively a reset. It's an acknowledgement that we can't do this anymore, so we better quickly get over this portion where the retinal image will be in flux. Hence why it's a fast phase, and the eyes will move very fast in this portion. So I've got the eyes moving right. That will be a very rapid movement right, hence why it's called the fast phase. Whereas the movement gradually left as the head's moving, that will be a slow movement of the eyes. Okay, so you very rapidly move your eyes to this reset location. Okay, you get that portion where the retinal image will be in flux over and done with, and then you try and keep the retinal image constant again. Okay, so overall what happens is the eyes move to the left within the head, then they suddenly do the fast phase and move back to the centre, and if the head continues to move, they'll do that a couple of times. They'll go to the left, then they'll reset to the uh, middle again, etc. And there's a name for this. This is what's known as vestibulo-ocular nystagmus. So you might have heard of this term, nystagmus, before. Nystagmus in some old language means nodding. So why is it being used here in terms of these eye movements of the eyes where they're going to one extreme and then they're resetting and then moving to that extreme again, oscillating backwards and forwards? Well, the idea is it's actually quite like nodding. You see, when you nod, you tend to move your head downwards quite slowly. So imagine when you're nodding, you tend to move your head downwards slowly and then when you're moving your head back upwards to reset it. So when you're doing the nod over and over again, in fact, I'll just show a little man who's going to be nodding. So when you usually do the nodding, 
you usually move your head forwards and downwards slowly and then when you're resetting you when you get to the limits of how much you can move your head downwards and forwards you then reset by moving your head backwards and that's usually very fast so that's why it's kind of analogous this is moving your head downwards and forwards is analogous to the slow phase and then suddenly resetting uh, by moving backwards fastly, that's analogous to the fast phase. So that's why this sort of an eye movement is referred to as nystagmus. And because it's triggered by the vestibular ocular reflex, it's called vestibular ocular nystagmus. There are other forms of nystagmus, such as optokinetic nystagmus and also pathological nystagmus. Okay, so that then is my discussion, initial discussion of the basic vestibular ocular reflex. This is the portion that we will be looking at the uh, neurobiology of. We will be trying to understand how the slow phase is done. The fast phase is done by something very different. Okay, the slow phase is the one that requires vestibular information because you need the movements of the eyes to be exactly calibrated to the movements of the head and it's the vestibular system that's going to be able to give you information about the movements of the head. In particular, we're looking really at rotations of the head, okay, so you're moving your head whilst keeping your body still, so it's going to be the semicircular ducts that are going to be delivering that uh, information. There is a vestibular ocular reflex that is for translational motion, but the pathways of that is far less well understood, so we'll ignore that one and we'll just consider this rotational vestibular ocular reflex. I'll come back right at the end once we've discussed the rotational vestibular ocular reflex to death and just mention this translational vestibular ocular reflex. But generally, when people say the vestibular ocular reflex, they just mean this well understood, beautiful one, this rotational vestibular ocular reflex. But I will uh, be very formal and go over the fact that there are two separate vestibular ocular reflexes, only one of which we've actually discussed right at the end. Okay, right. So, um, the other thing to say is that, of course, it's far more complicated than um, this, um, because we've only looked at this example of you being able to rotate your head round to the right. Of course, you can rotate your head all over the place, and for all of these different rotations, you will have this same slow phase of the vestibular ocular reflex uh, where uh, the vestibular system will measure the head's movement, the head's rotation, and will make sure that the eyes move in the opposite way relative to the head so that the retinal image is maintained as much as possible. And I'll stress again that we're only going to be studying the mechanism of the slow phase, not this resetting phase, which is the fast phase. Okay, right. So to begin with, what I want to do is just remind you of the three different planes of the uh, semicircular canals because they're going to be really important that we completely understand that. Then what I want to talk about is the extraocular muscles and I want to show you that the extraocular muscles of the two eyes are in one of these three planes that the semicircular canals are in. And then we'll start to say, for different rotations of the head, what, um, the, what muscles, what extraocular muscles are we going to need to contract? And then finally, what we'll see is how the neurobiology all fits together, how um, information from the semicircular canals is going to trigger all of this, and we'll see the actual synaptic pathways. Okay, so, uh, in fact, we'll do the initial bit here, I think. Um, so, just a reminder then of the three planes that the semicircular canals are present in. So, one of them is the horizontal plane, and I'll put that on last, actually. The other two are these planes that are 45 degrees away from the sagittal plane, and I'll draw it again like this so we can imagine that we're looking from above. So, remember, we have here the right anterior semicircular canal, and this is the left posterior semicircular canal, and you can see that they're in the same plane, so they are a pair of semicircular canals. Then here we have the left anterior semicircular canal, and the left, sorry, and the right posterior semicircular canal, which are also in the same plane, this plane that's, again, 45 degrees away from the sagittal plane, but in the opposite direction. And then finally, of course, we have the horizontal plane, which I'll just colour in in orange here. 
Now I'm going to come up with some non-standard abbreviations for these two planes. The horizontal plane will just abbreviate as H, which is perfectly sensible, but I want a quick way of saying this plane here, that the right anterior semicircular canal and left posterior semicircular canal are both in. So I'm going to abbreviate that down to the RALP plane, and I think that's reasonably sensible. Right anterior, left posterior. So RALP plane will mean this plane that the right anterior semicircular canal and the left posterior semicircular canal are in. On the same theme, what are we going to call the blue pair lane? Well, this is going to be the right posterior, left anterior plane, so the RPLA plane. Okay, so as I say, this is not standard nomenclature, I just want some names for these planes, some quick names that I can use, some quick abbreviations, and these are the abbreviations that I'm going to use. Okay, so, that's a reminder then of the three different planes that these pairs of semicircular uh, canals are present in. Next, in order to have any hope at all of understanding the vestibular ocular reflex, we need to have a good understanding of the muscles that move the eye, the extraocular muscles. Now there are um, six of these, so I'll get a new piece of paper and we'll have a look at them. And I want to clarify what each of them actually does to the eye, particularly what the uh, superior oblique and the inferior oblique muscles do, because there is a huge amount of confusion with regards to those muscles. Even textbooks get what those muscles do wrong, so I want to clarify that. Okay, so this next portion, and I'll make sure it's straight before we start, the next portion is on the extra ocular muscles. So these are the muscles outside of the eyes. Extra means outside, ocular means pertaining to the eyes. So the extraocular muscles. So firstly, what I want to do is start by studying the orbit. In particular, what I want to show you is the annulus of Zin, which is where most of the um, extraocular muscles, in fact, I think it's all but one of the extraocular muscles, are actually going to have their origin from. Okay, so we're going to be looking then from an anterior aspect into the back of someone's orbit, and we'll have the right-hand side here. So here, this is the orbit, and right at the back what we will be able to see is the superior orbital fissure and the inferior orbital fissure. So let's say this is the superior orbital fissure, and then here, sort of in the floor of the orbit, is the inferior orbital fissure. So I'll just put those key terms here. So we've got the superior orbital fissure and we've also got the inferior orbital fissure shown here. Okay, and of course lots of things come through these holes in the back of the orbit. Oh, and also of course a, a good landmark to put on there would be the optic canal through which uh, the optic nerve passes. So I'll just highlight these different structures up. So the superior orbital fissure is this hole which leads into the uh, inside of the skull there. The inferior orbital fissure is this hole here in pink. And then over there in orange, we've got probably the most famous hole, which is uh, the optic canal through which the optic nerve passes to get to the eye. Okay, right, so why am I showing you all of this? Well, the thing I want to show you is the annulus of Zin. And the annulus of Zin is a band of connective tissue, a ring of connective tissue that kind of goes in this sort of position. So there's a ring of connective tissue, thick, fibrous connective tissue, that surrounds the optic canal and surrounds a portion of the superior orbital fissure there. And this is known as the annulus, which means ring, of Zin, who is some person who discovered this, presumably. And this ring of connective tissue is where a lot of the extraocular muscles are going to take origin. In particular, all apart from the inferior oblique muscle are going to take origin from the annulus of Zin. Okay, so let's now go over the different uh, extraocular muscles then. So I'm going to draw a picture of the eye from the front in order to show this. So here is my picture of the eye. Here's the iris here, and the pupil there at the center. Okay, so to start with, let's have uh, the superior 
oblique, sorry, not the superior oblique, the superior rectus muscle. So the, the there are six extraocular muscles in total. Four of them have really simple names, and they're called the rectus muscles, and you have a superior one, a medial one, a lateral one, and an inferior one. We will start with those. All of those take origin uh, at the annulus of Zinn. So if you imagine the eye in here, the superior oblique is the one that attaches onto the top, and it will have this sort of shape. So here is its connection at the back, and it will be connecting onto the annulus of Zinn. And here is its connection at the front, where it's connecting onto the um, eye, like so. So this is what's known as the superior rectus muscle. Right, now the other three rectus muscles, so we'll have a medial rectus muscle, which again will have origin from the annulus of Zinn, like so. And the real reason I want to show you the annulus of Zinn is to emphasize that it's medially located, so all of these muscles are moving medially in this way. To connect onto it. So this muscle here is the medial rectus muscle. And I think I'll just sort of outline these muscles to make it clear where they are. So here's the superior rectus, like so. And now we'll have the inferior rectus. It's going to be more difficult for me to show that, so I might just show it like so. But again, it would be continuing backwards. In fact, I might sort of show it dashed like so. So it would be continuing backwards and attaching to the annulus of Zinn as well. So there is the inferior rectus muscle. And then finally, the lateral rectus muscle. Okay, it'll be attaching laterally, and again, it will be extending medially. So I'll sort of do it dashed like this to attach to the annulus of Zinn. So those are the uh, four rectus muscles, and we're showing it here on the right eye, but the mirror image will be uh, true on the left eye as well. Okay, so those are the very easy muscles to remember, superior, medial, inferior, and lateral rectus. Now let's do the more complicated ones. And actually, before we just have a, a discussion of the more complicated ones, let's discuss what we think these muscles are going to do. So the superior rectus, what do we think that's going to do when it contracts? Well, one of the things it's clearly going to do is it's going to pull the eye upwards. Hopefully you can appreciate it. If this was to shorten in length, the eye would be pulled upwards. But hopefully you can also appreciate that the way it's sort of moving medially, you can imagine that if this was to contract, it might actually end up pulling the eye outward, i.e. abducting the eye. If you imagine this sort of shortening, especially imagine this side shortening here, you can imagine the whole eye rotating outwards, okay, when this bit shortens here, the whole eye would rotate outwards, and indeed that is what the superior rectus does. It elevates the eye, that's one of its principal functions, so elevation, but also abduction, so abduction means moving outwards, away from the midline. Medial rectus, what do we think that does? When that contracts, of course, it's going to adduct the eye, it's going to move the eye towards the midline. You can imagine if this shortens in length, it will pull the eye, it will rotate the eye like this, so you'll move inwards towards the centre. Inferior rectus, if this was to shorten, you imagine that the eye will be pulled downwards, so depression, Okay, but also, again, because of the way that everything's oriented, it's oriented in this direction, it goes medially. So again, if this contracts, you can imagine, especially imagine this lateral part contracting, that the whole eye might be rotated outwards, and indeed that is what inferior rectus does. You also get, sorry, not abduction, uh, adduction, abduction, 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 so depression and abduction. And so the superior rectus and the inferior rectus, they both abduct the eye, as well as elevating and depressing it, respectively. A natural rectus is then very simple. If that contracts, it's going to pull the eye outwards, so that's going to be most definitely abduction. Okay, so now the two more complicated extraocular muscles, the oblique muscles, and these are the ones that cause a huge amount of confusion. So let's start off with the superior oblique. So superior oblique is also attached to the annulus of Zinn, and I'm colouring it now in, in blue. And it has this complicated course. It comes forward and then loops around a little piece of bone known as the trochlea of the superior oblique, and then it moves backward and attaches to the back of the eye. So it's actually quite helpful probably to see the eye 
from above. So let's draw a picture of the eye from above here. So here's the superior rectus muscle on the top of the eye here. Superior oblique comes along like this and loops around. It hasn't attached to the eye yet. It loops around a little loop here, Okay, which is in the side of the orbit here and is known as the trochlea of the superior oblique. So trochlea, and I'll just abbreviate superior oblique down to SO, and I'll write its full name here, superior oblique. Okay, so it loops around the trochlea of superior oblique, and then it will go backwards and connect onto the eye back here. Okay, so really the orientation of superior oblique is in this direction, like so, and think what's going to happen if this contracts. So if the superior oblique contracts, it's going to pull the eye forward. So imagine this contracting, pull this spot forward, and that will depress the eye. So superior oblique is going to depress the eye. Depression is one of the things, and here's the bit that people get really confused about. The other thing it's going to do is it's going to adduct the eye, adduction. Look at the direction that it's oriented. It's going medially, okay? So it's also going to end up uh, pulling the eye, um, well, I said uh, going medially isn't enough just to work this out. The superior rectus, we said that that's going to elevate and abduct, and the reason it was going to abduct is it's kind of going to pull this portion of the eye over here in this sort of direction, and therefore it's going to end up rotating the entire eye in this direction here. When the superior oblique contracts, it's going to pull this portion of the eye this way, and that actually ends up pulling the whole eye in this sort of direction. So you actually get adduction with the superior oblique. And I warn you, there is a huge amount of confusion about this. Wikipedia, I went on to Wikipedia for this, and Wikipedia tells you differently. Wikipedia tells you that it's depression and abduction, abduction. I don't think it is. I've had um, a consultant neurologist tell me that this is the way that it is, and all of the clinical charts that you see in hospitals on the walls, they tell you this, ophthalmologists tell you this, but loads of textbooks and indeed Wikipedia tells you it differently, they tell you that it's abduction. I don't think it is, I think it is adduction that superior oblique is involved in. So depression and adduction is what superior oblique does. Oh, and indeed, all of this uh, theory about the vestibular ocular reflex, it's consistent with the superior oblique doing that, rather than the superior oblique abducting the eye. Okay, so that, uh, I think, is the truth of what superior oblique does. Um, so, inferior oblique next. And again, there's the same confusion with inferior oblique as well. So inferior oblique is similar to superior oblique, except it doesn't have this portion here, and it does, and of course it's on the inferior aspect rather than the superior aspect, and it doesn't attach to the annulus of Zin. It's the only extraocular muscle that doesn't attach to the annulus of Zin. So it attaches similarly to superior oblique, but on the underside, and then it also attaches to the front of the orbit somewhere down here. Okay, so it's probably helpful to draw a picture of the bottom of the eye now. So let's have this as a picture of the bottom of the eye. Let's have this here as anterior and this as posterior. So this will be the inferior rectus muscle going backwards to the annulus of Zin here. And then to put on the inferior oblique muscle, it'll come down like this and attach onto the bottom of the eye over here. So what's inferior oblique going to do when it contracts? Well, one of the things it's going to do, of course, is it's going to elevate the eye because it will pull this portion forwards. And remember, we're looking at the bottom, so it will end up pulling the eye upwards. So elevation is one of the things it's going to do. But the other thing is it's also going to end up adducting the eye as well for the same reason as superior oblique adducts the eye. So when this contracts, it's going to end up pulling this portion of the eye towards it over there. And the way that actually turns out is it ends up rotating the eye round this way, and of course that's going to be, um, that's going to end up being um, adduction. And I do apologise for what I've drawn here. Uh, this is kind of like looking from above rather than from below. Okay, so really what I've 
effect of the draw on here is if we were looking from above and seeing what's on the underneath of the eye, or what you could imagine is this is the uh, right, sorry, the left hand eye which we are looking at from underneath. So I hope I haven't confused you with that picture. So what I've effectively drawn there is if you were sitting in the side of the eye looking down then you'd, and you could see through the bottom of the eye, you could see the inferior rectus here, this is anterior, this is posterior, and then the inferior oblique there. Or you could imagine that this is the opposite eye, the left hand eye, where you're looking from underneath uh, the eye. Either way around, that, I hope you understand what um, the inferior oblique is, where it is, its attachments and what it's going to overall do. Okay, so those are the extraocular muscles. The next thing that I want to convince you of is that actually these extraocular muscles, they all lie in one of those three planes that the pairs of semicircular, excuse me, that the pairs of semicircular canals are present within. So, let me draw another picture down here. So let's draw the two eyes here. So we'll say, this is the right hand eye, this is the left hand eye, so we're looking from above. Now let's put on the semicircular canals here. So here we go, here's the anterior right semicircular canal, here's the left anterior semicircular canal and the posterior ones here. So let's colour in the different planes and we'll use my abbreviations as before. So this is the right anterior left posterior plane, the RALP plane. And then we've got this plane here, which is of course the right um, posterior, left anterior plane, the RPLA plane. And then of course we've got the horizontal plane. So what I want to now do is draw on the extraocular muscles here and show you that they all lie in one of these planes. So let's start with the easiest plane here, which is the horizontal plane. So hopefully everyone is capable of deciding which muscles, uh, which extraocular muscles actually lie in the horizontal planes. So of course it's the medial and lateral rectus muscles. So let's add these onto the picture. So we'll start with the right hand eye here. So again, we're looking from above. Here is the uh, right medial rectus muscle, and here's the right lateral rectus muscle. On the left hand side, here's the left medial rectus muscle, and here's the left lateral rectus muscle. Okay, and you can see that all of those are within the horizontal plane. Okay, and when they contract, in particular, when they contract, the movements that they will make of the eyes, oh, and I apologise, I need to move this up a little bit, the movements that they will make of the eyes will be in the same plane. So if the lateral rectus here contracts, how is it going to move this eye? It's going to rotate it uh, rightward here, and that will move the eye within the horizontal plane. So it's going to produce rotation of the eye in that plane. So those four muscles, or two muscles on both sides, are all in the horizontal plane. So I'll put this in here. Horizontal contains medial rectus, and also lateral rectus muscles. Okay, so now the two more complicated planes. Let's start with the right anterior and left posterior plane. So which extraocular muscles are in this plane? Well, on the right hand eye, it's going to be the superior and inferior rectus muscles. So here is the superior rectus, and you can imagine that the inferior rectus would also be there. So I'll write this down, so we've got right superior rectus, which I'll abbreviate to RSR, and also the right inferior rectus, which I'll abbreviate to RIR. Okay, so those are the two extraocular muscles of the right hand eye that are going to be in this plane, and you can see that when they contract, they're going to move this eye in this plane as well. Okay, so when this contracts, it's going to move the eye upwards and also outwards. It's going to effectively move the eye in that plane, rotate it in the RALP plane. And the same for the right inferior rectus. So you see how beautiful this is starting to become, and it gets even better. Let's now have a look at the left hand eye. Well, of course, it's not going to be the left superior rectus and the left inferior rectus that are in this plane, because they're oriented that direction. They're going to be in the RPLA plane. So it, it must be the superior oblique and the inferior oblique. So let's draw on the superior oblique and the inferior oblique. So here is the superior oblique, like so. And of course the inferior oblique, I draw it sort of underneath, like 
that but of course it would be on the underside of the eye rather than on the superior side of the eye and hopefully you can appreciate that when they contract it's this bit that's important not this bit okay because this bit isn't connected to the eye they're going to pull the eye in this direction in this plane okay so they are going to contract and move the eye rotate the eye in the RALP plane so we'll add on left superior oblique and left inferior oblique which I hope you understand the abbreviations there okay so finally let's go to the RPLA plane okay the right posterior left anterior plane which extraocular muscles are going to be in this plane and all the, each of the planes contains four extraocular muscles. This one looks as though it contains fewer, but that's because I didn't distinguish between the right and left medial rectus here. If you like, I can put that in now. Right and left. Right and left. So there's four there. Okay, so the right posterior, left anterior. Let's start with the left eye, because that's going to be the easier one. So here we'll have the left superior rectus and the left inferior rectus so hopefully it's clear that they're oriented in this RPLA plane and when they contract they'll rotate the eye in the RPLA plane okay and hopefully you're starting to sort of suddenly make connections in your head as to the fact that you know these are going to detect motion in those planes and then we want the contrary motion in the eyes and now all of these muscles are going to rotate the eyes in the same plane so there's going to be hopefully some beautiful way of connecting these to these to get the right motions in the eye and indeed that's exactly how this is going to work and it is rather beautiful okay so the right posterior oops sorry about that lent on the desk and the whole thing shakes okay so the right posterior left anterior plane this is going to contain the left superior rectus and the left inferior rectus and on the right hand eye of course it will contain the right superior oblique which is in this position like so and again you can see it's sitting in the same plane as this and the right inferior oblique which will be underneath so if you've ever wondered why do you have these very strange muscles, the oblique muscles, I mean all the other ones seem incredibly sensible, why do you have to have these complicated ones? Well now you understand, they're in the same plane as one of the um, pairs of vestibular semicircular canals. Okay, so you have the right superior oblique over there, and the right inferior oblique as well. Okay, right, so to finish this video then, what I want to do is I want to talk through the different rotations of the head, which muscles would you want to be activated uh, in the, um, uh, which extraocular muscles would you want to be activated in order to maintain the same uh, retinal image, so to make sure that the eyes overall don't change the retinal image, so to get the exact opposite movement of the eyes with respect to the head that you have of the head. Okay, and then in the next video we'll take on the hardcore neuroanatomy of how this actually works, the pathways if you like. Okay, so let's start off with movements in the horizontal plane, which is the nice simple one. Okay, so let's start off with rotation to the right in the horizontal plane. So let's imagine that we have moved the whole head to the right, and I think, in fact, it would be helpful to have a little picture of the head, so I'll just slot it in there, even though really the head should be like this. Okay, so here's the nose. So we're imagining that the head is moving to the right now. Okay, so let's think about um, which extraocular muscles we would want to actually move in order to uh, get a contrary movement of the eyes to try and fix the retinal um, image. Now, of course, we know that the semicircular canals that are going to be activated are the horizontal semicircular canals, where one will be activated, indeed the right one will be activated, and the left one will be inactivated. But don't worry about that at the moment. Just what I want to focus on at the moment is which muscles would I want to move in order to keep the same retinal image. So I want the two eyes to move to the left therefore so which ones do I want to move I want the left lateral rectus to move and the right medial rectus to move so I would want left lateral rectus and right medial rectus to be activated 
OK, so how can I put that? I want those to be activated. I'll put pluses here. So I want those two to be activated. And which ones would I absolutely not want to be activated? Well, I wouldn't want um, the left medial rectus to be activated. So left medial rectus, I'll put a negative there because that would move the eyes to the right. And I wouldn't want the right lateral rectus to be activated. OK, so can you see here that there might be an incredible way of doing this because one of the semicircular canals is going to be activated and one's going to be inhibited. So if we had this one controlling these two muscles, then when it becomes activated, these two muscles will become activated. And if we had this one controlling these two muscles, then when this one becomes inactivated, these two muscles will become inactivated. And that's exactly how it's going to work. We will see the neurobiology though later on. OK, so that's rotation to the <coughs> right. Just to nail this concept in, let's do rotation now to the left, again in the horizontal plane. So if we rotate our head this time uh, to the left, then of course we'll want our eyes to rotate within the head to the right. OK, so which muscles would we want to activate? Well, we'd want to move, activate the two muscles that move you to the right, and these are the two that we wanted to inhibit previously. So we'd want to activate the left medial rectus and the right lateral rectus. So I'll put pluses there. OK, so we want to activate those two muscles. And we'd want to inactivate the two muscles that move the eyes to the left within the skull, which are the left lateral rectus, this one here, and also the right medial rectus. So we'd want to inhibit those two. And again, this is looking absolutely perfect because look, if we rotate our head to the left, that's going to activate the left horizontal semicircular canal and inhibit the right horizontal semicircular canal. I said we'd put the left horizontal semicircular canal in charge of these two muscles. OK, so when it becomes activated, those two are going to be activated. Oh, look, they've been activated. I said we put the right horizontal semicircular canal in charge of these two muscles. It's now inactivated, so these two have become inactivated. It's beautiful, beautiful symmetry. OK, and we'll see the neurobiology behind this later on. So now the scarier planes. Uh, so that was a nice easy plane. Now let's do the rotation in the right anterior left posterior plane. And this is the reason I wanted a nice abbreviation for this plane. And I will uh, talk about rotation in other planes, the more sort of like conventional planes, like the sagittal plane uh, right at the end. That's the most complicated of all, but we'll come on to that. OK, so rotation in the right anterior left posterior plane. So that's Firstly, have rotation forwards, so that's sort of like rotation like this, moving your head down uh, at forwards and downwards in this strange sort of plane, uh, which you can do, but would you ever really do that in normal life uh, is another matter, but you can certainly do it. If you did move your head down like that, what sort of eye movements would we want in order to make sure that the eyes uh, are going to have the same retinal image? So they want, want to move in the exact opposite direction, so we want to pull those upwards uh, and backwards in this way, so we want them to come up like this. So which muscles do we want to contract then? Well, for the right hand eye here, we want to contract the right superior rectus. OK, I hope you'll agree. That's going to pull the eye up, and it's going to move it sort of backwards like that. OK, which one would we want to contract over here? Well, it would be the left inferior oblique. We wouldn't want to contract the left superior oblique, because that would pull the eye downwards and down that way. OK, so this is more complicated. So we want to contract the left inferior oblique. So we want those two to become activated. OK. Meanwhile, we want the other two muscles, so the right inferior rectus, the other two muscles in the plane, we want the right inferior rectus. Oh, and by the way, of course, I'm just talking about the muscles in the plane. We don't, of course, when we were doing these movements, we wouldn't have wanted any of the other muscles to be moving either, but these are the ones we specifically want to make sure they're absolutely not there because they're performing the exact opposite movements. Okay? So the other muscles in the plane, 
that we'd want to inhibit, we'd want to have the right inferior rectus, which does the exact opposite of the right superior rectus. It's in the same plane and it's sort of pulling against it. We'd want that inhibited, and we'd want the le uh, left superior oblique inhibited, because that does the opposite of the left inferior oblique. So we want those two inhibited. So again, this is going to work the same way. Okay, we're going to have one of the semicircular canals here in charge of these two, and let me just work it out. So if we move forward like that, of course that will mean that the fluid is moving effectively backwards like this, away from the ampulla of the anterior semicircular canal, and that will activate it. So I believe that when you make this movement, you'll get the anterior uh, semicircular canal over here the right anterior one activated and this one inhibited. So we, we could put this one in charge of these two muscles and this one in charge of these two muscles in this plane. And this is exactly how it's going to work. The semicircular canals in each of the planes will control the muscles that are in the same plane and one of them will control two of the muscles and the other will control the contrary muscles. Okay, so to absolutely nail this, let's go through the opposite movement. So if we were to move our head backwards in this plane, so a movement like this, what would that do? Okay, uh, so we'd be moving our head backwards and upwards, so we want to move our eyes downwards in, in this direction, so we want to move them down like that. So which muscles in this plane are we going to contract and which ones are we going to inhibit? Well in this case we're going to want to contract the right inferior rectus, which will exactly pull the eye down like that and we want to contract the left superior oblique as well, which would pull the eye down and like that. Okay, uh, then the ones we'd want to inhibit, we'd want to inhibit the right superior rectus and the left inferior oblique. So again, you can imagine how this is going to work beautifully, because when we do this movement, it's going to be the left posterior semicircular canal that will be activated and this one that will be inhibited. I said we put this one in charge of these two muscles and look, they're the ones that are now needing to be activated. Uh, this one's inhibited, it was in charge of these two, those muscles are now going to be inhibited. So it's all going to work beautifully. Now, I don't think I need to go through the RPLA plane because that's just the mirror image of all of that. So you can write out the RPLA plane for yourself. It will involve the three muscles in blue there. As I say, it's just the mirror image of this, so I don't think it's necessary to uh, go through all of that. What I do want to just talk you through is give you the confidence to think about rotations in other planes. So let's do the sagittal plane, which is a plane that you're more used to potentially moving your head in. So when you nod, you are rotating your head in the sagittal plane. Okay, so what's going to happen with the sagittal plane? So let's imagine firstly moving our head downwards like this. Okay, so we move our head downwards, so downwards and forwards. So which muscles do we think are going to be activated when we do this? Well, we know which canals are going to be activated. It's going to be the right anterior um, semicircular canal here and the left anterior semicircular canal here. At least I think it is. Let me just confirm that. So think this through. If we move our head downwards, then the fluid will move upwards away from the ampullae of the anterior semicircular canals and that will activate them towards the ampullae of the posterior semicircular canals which will inhibit them. Okay, so these ones are going to be activated, these ones are going to be inhibited. Which muscles did we say we were putting the anterior semicircular canals in charge of? We said we were putting them in charge of this muscle and this muscle, as far as the right anterior one was concerned. Okay, and this one, which two would it have been in charge of? Well, the opposite, basically, the left superior rectus and the right inferior oblique. So what we're actually going to end up activating is we'll end up activating the right superior rectus, the left inferior oblique, and we'll end up activating the ones for this one, which are the left superior rectus and the right inferior oblique. So I hope that makes sense. I said that this one was in charge of those. We talked through that explicitly. Okay, so when this becomes activated, we're going to most definitely activate those two. Okay, which ones are the... Uh, pos is the left anterior semicircular canal in charge of? Well, it's the equivalent but on the 
opposite sides, so switch everything round. And if you want me just to talk through this, if we were to move downwards in this plane, okay, so the RPLA plane, so if we were to move down like that, then that would result in the activation of this, okay? Which muscles would we want to move in order to get a vestibular ocular reflex? Well, we'd want the eyes to move upwards like that. So which muscles would we want to contract? Superior rectus and also inferior oblique over here. So left, superior rectus, which is what I've got over here, and right, inferior oblique. Okay, and you could go through all the ones that will be inhibited by the posterior ones, but they're not as important to go over. The ones that are really important to think about are which ones are going to be activated. What's overall going to be the result of activating all of these? So, in the right-hand eye, we are activating the right superior rectus and the right inferior oblique. What are those going to do? So, right superior rectus, that pulls the eye upwards and outwards, okay? Right inferior oblique, that pulls the eye upwards as well. Remember how complicated the obliques are. Inferior oblique is on the bottom, that will pull the uh, this back bit forwards and therefore pull the eye upwards. We're talking about inferior oblique, remember. But it also moves the eye inwards. So one of them's trying to pull the eye outwards, one of them's trying to pull the eye inwards. Overall, you won't get any movement outwards or inwards, but you will get a good movement upwards. So overall, this is saying the right eye will go upwards, which is exactly what we want, because we are moving our head downwards and forwards in that nodding portion. So we want the eyes to just go straight upwards. So the right eye is going to go upwards, and hopefully you agree that the left eye is going to do exactly the same thing, because we're activating the exact same muscles on the other side. Okay, left superior rectus and left inferior oblique, so it's going to move upwards as well. So the two eyes will move perfectly upwards. Okay, so I hope that gives you a taster of how this is going to work. I hope that you can have a play around with this, okay? Understand the crucial concepts that you need to understand is that the semicircular canals operate in pairs in these three different planes, okay? The extraocular muscles, of which there are 12, are in these three planes. Four are in each plane, okay? And we've been through which four are in each plane. They, these, the muscles in each of the planes are under the control of the two semicircular canals in those planes. And each of the semicircular canals will control two of the muscles. Okay? Uh, so when you make certain, when you make a movement, one of the semicircular canals in that, in each of these planes, one of the semicircular canals will be activated and one will be inhibited and the one that will be activated will activate the muscles that are going to move the eyes in the opposite direction to the direction that the head is moving. The one that's been inhibited will be the one that's in control of the opposite muscles which will move the eyes in the opposite direction to the direction that we need them to be uh, moving. So in each of the planes where you have these extraocular muscles, you have two muscles that are moving the eyes in one direction in that plane, and two muscles that are moving the eyes in the opposite direction in that plane. So you see hopefully how beautiful this is going to work. And what we will do in the next video is we'll see the neurobiology which links each of the semicircular canals up with the two muscles that it's going to control, and we'll see how all of this is going to work. So come back in the next video and we will see the complete picture. But I hope that's given you a taster of how beautiful this is.